Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Hey, friends, Steve Keating. Uh, before we get into the show, I wanted to mention that Team has supported this particular podcast, and I'm really grateful for them reaching out to us. And they mentioned that they would like to give uh, members of the Myopia Podcast community a $250 discount off of their first virtual assistant. If you have not considered uh, bringing in a virtual team, uh, I can attest to how wonderful it is. Over the last two years, we brought in uh, about 10 team members onto our uh, practice. We've used different staffing services and we've had issues over the years with our staff not getting paid, having issues here or there, issues with the communication. And that has been really taken care of since we've joined up with team and their uh, their group of virtual people. Uh, it's been fantastic and I would highly recommend that you consider doing it for your office. They can do things by answer the phone for you. They can uh, check uh, insurances. They can get patients calls they can check on uh describing for you in the exam room and do a host of different things particularly in the myopia community it's great to have somebody that can be in charge of these sort of things checking on those myopic patients seeing how they're doing and giving them a care call after they've had orthokeratology for a day uh, and just kind of be a right hand to you in the exam room or to your billing team or your front desk consider higher team.com h-i-r-e-t-e-e-m.com or click the show notes to get the 250 dollars discount when you sign up now back to the show thanks for listening to this episode i want to again thanks team for their support of this particular podcast uh they have been a great supporter of the myopia community helping to uh make clinicians and offices run better whether it's calling and scheduling appointments whether it's answering the phone helping with billing issues scribing in the exam room whatnot having a virtual team member in your practice is a real show stopper so with that, I want to thank team again for their support. Check them out at hireteam.com. That's H-I-R-E-T-E-M.com or click the notes in the show description below. Thanks again to team. Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we are uh, joined by Lanchis Michaud, mm-hmm. and we are uh, excited to talk about some of the things that are really, uh, really at forefront of his mind with regards to myopia management. But first, I want to let everybody know we are recording live from the Vision by Design meeting, which you are a staple at. You Every year, we get to see you at every this year. meeting. Um, we are in Chicago right now, uh, 2023, in our recording. But I do want to mention, uh, make sure to mark your calendars for October 2nd through the 5th to come down to Dallas, and you can hear Lungis lecture in person. I'm sure they're going to ask you again next year, uh, right? Probably. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. don't know, but probably, yeah. So uh, the Vision by Design meeting, as most everybody knows, is the orthokeratology and myopia management meeting put on by the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. And just a great, great meeting in those arenas. And if you want to go to boot camp, you can, everybody needs to go through boot camp at least once, regardless of whether you've done this forever or you're just starting off. And uh, you've, you've been coming to the meeting for quite a few years. Uh, six, seven years in yeah. a row. Yeah, yeah, yeah. certainly. Uh, and way before pandemic, at yeah. least. And it's the, uh, the energy of practitioners. Here. Yeah. We are all passionate by myopia management and to help kids. And, and we are all want to learn what yeah. is new and to share experience. You know, yeah. I, I learn as much uh, here uh, as, as I deliver lecture. You yeah. Know, it's, you yeah. know, Practitioners with 30 years in Art OK, for example, you know, right. yeah, I, will, I will learn a lot from them right. because they, right. they saw everything yeah. and they went through every design possible and they have their own ideas about what is working, what is not yeah. working and the best way to address the patient's needs. So it's, it's really a unique meeting for them. Yeah, it is. Um, Lungis, will you tell us a little bit about 
who you are, where you're from, and what you do on an everyday basis other than just teach all of us. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I was born in a small town in near Quebec City, so it's coming from Quebec. Born and raised in French, 100%. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, went to uh, high school, college there. Uh, optometry was a passion, health science in general, passion me uh, as many college students you know biology courses just attract me and okay this is what I want to to understand and to do in my life and, and then by elimination optometry came and and I I was really passionate about optometry went to Montreal because it, this is the only school that we have in Quebec and and uh, after that graduate uh, and I started my private practice I bought in fact my optometrist family optometrist practice okay when I uh, just uh, be graduated and I was in private practice for 15 years uh, in my you know yeah. bird town uh, acquired other offices in the area having associates we had you know t- at the end three uh, big offices 26 staff all that stuff um, but I needed challenge, in the intellectual and clinical challenges, because after 15 years, you know, the population was not growing that much, and there was ne- really no other opportunities to grow the practice. Mm. And, and I, um, in the meantime, I was um, mentored by Daniel Brazo and Jacques Signy, who um, introduced me to the American Academy of Optometry. That was my first eye-opening experience yeah. in optometry. Yep. Uh, I never attended that meeting before, and I, I said, okay, oh, this is optometry, and this is a science, and this is it. And at a given point, um, uh, I, they convinced me to do my fellow, and then my diploma. Jack was one of the few diplomas that we have in Canada in cardiac and contact lenses. And I did my diplomate, and obviously you have to write case reports yeah. and, and go through exam, all that stuff. And I realized, okay, I, I have a few of these cases in my practice, but not as much as I may want. And um, to make a long story short, you know, because I did my diplomate, then uh, the school recruited me as kind of an expert clinician once in every because I was practicing 400 kilometers from the school so it was not easy to go right. there every week so I was there pro- probably once a month and then twice a month mm. and uh, I decided to do my master and the rest is history at a given moment they offered me a position and yeah. uh, I sold everything I had uh, never regret it and uh, so, so I became an academic yeah. I, I, I'm coming from a family of academic people yeah. and I always said it's not for me yeah (laughs) (laughs) that was your mistake that that's that was my mistake and uh, life is life you know and so what are you doing what are you doing in in academia in academia obviously i started uh as a mostly in clinic uh, a little bit of didactic courses a little bit of research and over the years it evolved you know i'm not so involved now in classroom meaning i I teach here and there, you know, a few hours, but I, in clinic every week, yeah. seeing patients. I'm a, I have a reference clinic, so the worst of the worst are coming in my exam chairs, mm. meaning referred by ophthalmologists, fellow optometrists, yeah. and uh, so. And part of uh, this is part of my week. Rest of my week, research began slowly, but now it's, I think, the most part of my. Doing a lot of research. Doing a lot of research. Yeah. In sclerals, in uh, physiological response to scleral lens wear, and now in myopia management. Yeah. Well, you have uh, certainly taken an interest in this particular arena, and I have tons of questions about what's happening to the eye with regards to myopia management. And I think several of us have seen this response in, especially if we're measuring axial length, Mm -hmm. that sometimes when we do axial length on our patients, it seems like the eyeball gets shorter. Yep. And uh, that's weird. That's weird. That's weird. So it's got to be due to this choroidal effect, and you know a lot about that. Can you can you share a little bit about what what is going on? And uh, how, how do we look into this? And is this a part of the future of managing the effectiveness yeah. of myopia? So we know that the um, quality of the visual signal 
entering into the eye will dictate how the retina in the eye will respond. So, and we know it's a local reaction. It's not the brain. It's not driven by the brain. It's right. driven by the retina. Yeah. Then you have these lights entering, these rays of lights entering in the eye. And the retina can interpret a lot of things, and uh, especially two types of defocus, you know, hyperopic and myopic defocus. Regardless of the defocus that is hitting the retina, some cells will release biomodulators, chemical components that will influence the current underneath, either to become thicker or thinner, depending on the biomodulator's release. Generally speaking, we consider that a hyperopic defocus through a single vision pair of glasses, for example, will be will generate a negative impact, meaning that the cord will become thinner. And um, we have, a, if we have a myopic defocus, uh, then we have a positive response, and the cord will become thicker, mostly through the action of those biomodulators, mm -hmm. and also by increasing the blood flow. Blood mm -hmm. flow is increasing. You know, choroid is a, is a erectile tissue that is reacting very, very uh, well to the uh, blood flow. So the higher the blood flow is, the thickness and the, the, it's swelling, in fact, yeah. because of the blood flow. And then it's transferred to the sclera. And the fibers of collagen in the sclera are reacting to those biomodulatory direction of the choroid and rearrange themselves. So either the sclera will become stiffer or softer. Stiffer resists to eye elongation, softer tends to elongate. So when you measure actual length, you measure the obviously the dimension between the, the apex of the cornea and the pigmentary epithelium mm -hmm. layer of the retina. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a good response, or 2K for example, generating a lot of the focus, hitting the retina, cord will become thicker, but there's a limited room to, for that increased volume in the back of the eye. So it will push back the retina a little bit and the pigmentary epithelium will be put forward in, in the direction of the front of the eye. So when you reevaluate actual length, it seems to be shorter, but it's, it's a short-term reaction. It will go back to normal after five, six months. Okay. Because short-term reaction is one thing, long-term reaction is another thing. But generally speaking, we have to understand that any kind of optical device used for myopia management has to influence the retinal response in a way to increase choroidal thickness. And then, because of that increased thickness, to remodulate the sclera and the sclera becomes stiffer at that time and resists to elongation. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Yeah. And there's a dose response, meaning that you know some patients will need more defocus to create that effect. Some patients will need less. Higher miles, for example, will need more. Um, and and it, it's all about individualization and customization of, of, of the strategy we put in front of those kids. Okay, uh, that was a phenomenal answer. And uh, there was a lot in there that we need to unpack. Um, let's start with uh, if, uh, let's start with something that may be a little controversial um, based on what we are knowing about the choroid. Could it be that if we are not correcting people who have myopia with a myopia management solution, that we could be further driving myopia to get worse based upon the signal that we're giving the retina? Of course. Of yeah. course. If, if you, have you said that with spectacle, single vision spectacle lenses, exactly. right? Exactly. If you have, let's say, a kid of nine years old, Minus two, first time in your exam chair, and uh, he's wearing glasses, minus two, single vision. Six months, uh, last exam was done six months ago. You're examining the, 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 uh, the kid under cycloplegia because it's first visit, and you find 250. Yeah. Okay? So it's increase of half a diopter in six months. Pretty huge, you know, yeah. more than expected. Yeah. In the past, we didn't even ask any question. Uh, you know, we uh, okay, your your uh, your refraction moves, so let's have new uh, a pair of new glasses. Nowadays, it's an indication that you know 
this kid is out of control. And the reason why it's out of control is the quality of the visual signal, again, hitting the retina, gives a, a, a negative answer, a negative stimulation because of this hyperopic defocus. We called it hyperopic defocus because when we have a single vision pair of glasses in front of the eye, you are in focus at the fovea, but part of the image is formed behind the yeah, eye. Yeah, it's so it's called hyperopic defocus. And, and part of the reason why myopia evolved is the retina take that in account and try to stretch it to reach that mm -hmm. image at a given point. But it's, it, it's more the biomodulator released at the retinal level because of this signal that will influence the softness and then the remodeling of that IND elongation at the end of the day. So providing single vision glasses to a kid that is evolving nowadays must be considered malpractice. Secondly, um, and thank you for saying that. That is a bold statement, but I think... Uh, uh, I, I endorse it, 100%. Uh, yeah, I, th I, I mean, if we're not doing myopia management, we're, we're watching these kids just get worse, and we know what you myopia give, you does. You give sugar right? to a diabetic patient. It's and the same you, thing. You I send, love it. <laughs> yeah. It's like sugar to a diabetic patient. You, you put, you put patient. a cigarette to asthmetic patient. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a, that's, I love it. Okay, and so um, the response that we get from the choroid is short-term, you said in five or six but months. In fact, it, 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 it happens very rapidly in, yeah. in a matter of seconds. And as long as the stimulation is sustained, you will keep the, the, the reaction we'll keep going it. on. Yeah. What, what happens is the, um, the volume will be redistributed a little bit and the retina will go back to its original position after five, six months. So most of the patients will go back to where they were without evolving. Mm -hmm. I have very few, but some patients with permanent shrinkage of their eye. Meaning yeah. they, they have you know 0.5 millimeter less compared to what they were at baseline. Yeah, and it and, hasn't and come back. And they yeah. never come back, but it's yeah. rare, it's yeah. rare. Eventually we come back five, six months and then it stabilizes over time. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, is, uh, is this a response that as time goes on, you anticipate we will be specifically customizing our treatment in order to achieve the maximum amount of it. Not only it will happen, but we have to do it. Yeah. In order to increase the um, the outcome that we have, you know, we we are at the infancy of those technologies, meaning that across the board, if you look at ortho K soft multifocal lenses, atropine, antimyopia glasses, we are fortunate in Canada. We have yeah, access you have to them. Yep. We have yep. all of them. We are the guinea pigs of the world. <laughs> <laughs> so um, they are all about you know qualified with the same efficacy uh, at, at the end it's 50 60 70 I don't I hate to talk about person but you know people will understand you control at 60 70 percent you know the normal evolution of that kid if we want really to make a difference on the long term especially on those fast progressors and very high myopes we have to do way better. We have to reach 80, 90, 95. And as I said, there's a dose response. So we have to increase the dose. The dose is the amount of the focus and the, the area that is impact. We know that the retina that is sensitive is limited. Yeah. It's, it's centrally, the, the fovea plays a role. It, it's not non-significant, it's significant. But most of the reaction comes from the peripheral retina and when I talk about peripheral retina it's not 30 degrees apart right yeah it's fi 10 to 15 degrees beyond the beyond macula. the fovea yeah so it's the macular area it's five yeah. millimeter around the fovea yeah. so this is and the superior quadrant and the temporal quadrant react more compared to the nasal and inferior why because the cord is thinner in the nasal and inferior part mm -hmm. naturally right compared to the other. so there Following are less the tissue to rule to right. become swollen yeah yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, that, that makes sense. I want to touch on two other things, and the first one is um, in, in regular clinical practice for myopia, where we don't necessarily have incredible abilities to measure the choroid, um, is the, uh, 
is is the uh, ability for us to specifically look at a patient's um, axial length telling us that we've done a pretty good job in this? Can I measure axial length and say, heck, I got a, 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 I got a shrinking of the eye, I'm doing what I want, versus somebody who doesn't get a shrinkage of their eye and be like, oh, I need to change something. So could I look in the first three months and say, hey, I'm doing a good job with this? Not only the three months, but six months, 12 months, 18 months, as long as you are following the kids. So you have two type of metrics you can measure in the office, diopters <laughs> and atrial limb. Mm -hmm. And most of the speakers and experts will say, oh, Atrial length is not so mandatory. You can practice myopia management without adding in that. But uh, but I'm meaning in a, in contrast to measuring in the choroid. Like yeah. I, you know, most of us don't have great tools to measure of the course. choroid of thickness. Course. Of course. But is axial length actual an, length, uh, an okay way to do it? That's my point. Axial length must be must be yeah the, the best way matrix yeah. And honestly, we have to forget diopters. Yeah. Because. Most of the kids I, I'm seeing, there's no correspondence between the evolution of both, I, especially with atropine. So, atropine as a single monotherapy, you can freeze the diopters. The mm -hmm. minus three will remain minus three for the next 24 months. Yeah. But if you look at the actual length, it still continue to evolve by 0 0.3, 0 0.4 millimeter per year, which is way too much. We're breaking up that correlation. We're not realizing that it's as substantial as we used to think. We exactly. used to say it was and one to one, but it's not. It, it, it's not. In certain kids, yes it is. In certain kids, it's not. So you never know in yeah. advance. And the, the only way to evaluate your real progress or not, or, or your, your contr if you control well, is to evaluate the actual end. Yeah. And if we think about that, what is the um, the risk factor for pathology over time? It's stretching of the eye, so yeah. it's the actual length again. Yeah. So, and every week I see patients, young patients, minus one, minus two, nine, ten years old. One is twenty-three millimeter of actual length. The second one is twenty-five millimeter of actual yeah. length. You know, and obviously the twenty-five at nine, not control is at, at risk, at higher risk of mm -hmm. pathology in the future. I will treat it you know, more aggressively compared to the 23 millimeter that is probably evolving as fast as the other one. But, you know, I have a margin of error between 23 and for, for those familiar with that, the limit to save pathology is 26 millimeter. Over 26 millimeter, you face significant problems. Yeah. So the goal is to refrain the elongation to never reach 26 millimeter, which, which you cannot do with, with diopters. We say not go over minus six but again I, I can't have a minus right. six yeah. with a very short eye with no risk of and a minus attachment. three that's a 26 and minus three right. with yeah. attachment because it's 27. so uh, this is just this is the last thing i'm, I'm kind of curious about and i don't i can't imagine that there has been any study that has looked into this because this choroidal information is so new to us in the last couple of years but um over 26 millimeters are risks of visual impairment, according mm -hmm. to one study, is 25%. Right, so that's a pretty high risk mm -hmm. if you have a, a, a longer eye, you know, macular disease, what it may be. What about in a subgroup of patients that are adults who have a high axial length? Do you foresee, and I know we're completely speculating, that there could be a protective effect if we did orthokeratology in a group like that as an adult? Could we protect their macula by getting a little bit of that thickening of the, uh, of, of the choroid? If the eye is already very high myope, probably not. That okay. increased blood flow? It increased blood flow, and blood flow helped to resist to elongation. We have some adults that are still going on with, with evolution yeah, so yeah. then it may help them because of the elongation but once they're stopped when they're stopped habitually and and i recently there's no paper on that but you know it stopped why because we are talking about fibers of collagen that are yeah. remodeling themselves and recently one of my students told me you know what you know it's just like keratoconus i said what 
Now, Caracol Kunis is evolving during 20 years yeah. and stabilized by itself because collagen fibers become more crosslink by themselves and tend to be more stable during 20 years. In myopia, the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we have this evolution during 20 years and then after that it's stabilized. But when it's stabilized, we have a tissue in high myopia, it's already very thin. And because it's altered and damaged already because of the stretching related to high myopia, nail vessels will develop anyway because of the, the signals of these injured cells and injured mm -hmm. structure that are there and we cannot mm -hmm. prevent anymore, it's there. Uh, it, obviously, if there's more that will add up, you know, it will be even yeah. worse. And then because of the damaged structure, you have the room and the space for new vessels to come in and, and, and to link. It's, it's, a macular, it's a wet macular degeneration that yeah. is occurring, in fact. What is most concerning is the glaucoma because the stretching altered the lamina cruciata structure. Absolutely. And, 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 and then uh, you, you, you have a, a normal tensive glaucoma. You have normal pressure, but the damage visible adapting nerve, so very difficult to treat. And there's new literature in, in the last two years showing that all of these pathological processes may be linked to hypoxia. Yeah. Uh, hypoxia of the choroidal tissue because the blood flow is n is reduced with high myopia. Yeah. Then sclera suffers from hypoxia and remodel yeah. in a way that is damaged. And you don't think by doing some sort yeah, of yeah some sort of increasing blood flow may help to do not increase the risk but not reducing the one that is already yeah, present. Yeah. And, uh, those studies are yet to be done. It would be awesome, and, and, and if we were able to use orthokeratology yeah, to reduce that, and we that, right? we may think about you know a hyperbaric you know exposure yeah. just to increase the oxygen perfusion yeah. on, on those tissues. I don't know. Yeah, you know that that may be one one element to treat you know high yeah. myopia in the future. Well, if we don't come away from any conversation with more questions than we went into them, right, <laughs> we would be a failure as, as researchers and scientists. That, exactly. was, uh, that was awesome. Thank you for your perspectives. Thank this you, has David. been a was very a real, enlightening and, and Real and pleasure. Fun. In fact, I just want to encourage everybody listening to us to endorse myopia management next morning. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if you don't have all the equipment, start it again. Yeah. Start, start it Get anyway. Going. But... You know, make sure to get the proper education, proper instrumentation yeah. along the way. Yeah. You can do so much yeah. to help kids that, you know, again, it's really valuable yeah. to be involved in that area. I appreciate your perspectives. Thank you and very much. And what better way to learn more about myopia management than coming to Vi uh, Vision by Design? Vision by Design is the place to come. Yep. October uh, 2nd through the 5th in Dallas. We'll be looking forward to seeing you there. And uh, thank you for joining us for this episode. With, with my cowboy hat. That's <laughs> <laughs> Make sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. One, two, three, four. Thank you for tuning in to the Myopia Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.